Welcome to episode 36 of Liberty Dad Podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery, recognizing that tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today, and then applying it to those around me. I'm your host, D.L., and this episode is the experience of being experienced. This is a this episode is part two of my series on race-related matters. Don't worry if you didn't listen to the last one. Each episode is independent of the other. However, to get the fullest context, I definitely recommend watching them all. In episode 34, I discuss hearing the voice of others as a matter of listening. For those who prefer a discussion-style episode, go ahead and check out episode 35, where instead of just me, I'm joined by my co-host, Josh Fields, from the Libertarian Apothecary, and then we discuss the very same topic. This week, I discuss the experience of being experienced. And what does that mean, you ask? Well, let's dive in and find out. Hey, everyone. I'm back. When we discuss politics, what can we learn from a former FBI hostage negotiator and an internationally known psychologist? I tell you what, I'm going to give you a few moments to think about that answer. Okay, do you have an answer? I do. But before we get into that answer, in the last episode... Season 2, Episode 1, I said the following. To address the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter issue, we need to go beyond those words and, in fact, ignore those words altogether because the root of the divide is much deeper. Ignoring the divide between those words, Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, kind of sidesteps the issue. And that was on purpose. The goal of the episode was to communicate listening by example. In this episode, I'm going to take a slightly closer look at the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter dispute. A moment ago, I asked you what we could learn from an internationally known psychologist and a former FBI hostage negotiator. In a chapter titled Recipe for Rapport in his book, Social Intelligence, Daniel Goldman says this, Rapport feels good, generating the harmonious glow of being simpatico, a sense of friendliness where each person feels the other's warmth, understanding, and genuineness. These mutual feelings of liking strengthen the bonds between them, no matter how temporary. That special connection always entails three elements, mutual attention, shared positive feeling, and a well-coordinated nonverbal duet. As these three arise in tandem, we catalyze rapport. Shared attention is the first essential ingredient. As two people attend to what the other says and does, they generate a sense of mutual interest, a joint focus that amounts to perceptual glue. Such two-way attention spurs shared feelings. One indicator of rapport is mutual empathy. Both partners experience being experienced. That's a lot. Feel free to go back and re-listen if you need. For this next part, I want you to just quickly think about a memorable moment that you've had with another person. Maybe it's a significant other, or a sibling, a parent, a friend, or whomever. I imagine you probably thought of more than one. I thought of two. Liberty Wife and I joke about our first date, which was an evening where we met for dinner, then a movie, and a wine tasting at her friend's house. At the time, we weren't dating, but since then, I have totally declared it a retroactive date. (laughs) Anyway, initially, I wasn't planning to go to the wine tasting, but because we went and saw Paranormal Activity 2 and horror films spooked me, 
I change my mind after. Because this was like 10 years ago, there are two things that really stick out in my mind. One, a bottle, a blue bottle of Riesling changed my perspective about wine, and we did a lot of snickering that night. I don't know, I didn't know anyone other than my now wife, and she was friends with at least the hostess. That night, we laughed and giggled and snickered all the way through the evening. Now, contrast that with my second memorable experience, which was vastly different. Before I moved out on my own, sometime around the age of 20 or 21, my mother and I would stay up late watching television shows. We frequently engaged in deep conversations about life and politics and religion, and many other things. Sometimes we agreed, and sometimes not. But we always enjoyed our conversations and left feeling positive about having had the conversation. These two experiences are both examples of the experience of being experienced. And yet, they illustrate being experienced in two entirely different ways. The wine tasting was more temporary. Our shared sense of being created rapport based on what was happening in the moment. Late night talks with my mother? Well, those were more long-term and recurring. The wine tasting might be remembered as that one time, while the late night talks might be remembered as a fond memory of. Both are two people building a rapport through mutual attention, shared positive feeling, and a well-coordinated nonverbal duet. Take those thoughts and consider the last exchange that you recall between two people regarding the All Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter, or Blue Lives Matter, or anything. And ask yourself, did that exchange sound like it was or was leading to people being experienced? What tends to happen is that people walk away from the conversation with no better understanding of the other's position or why that person feels so drawn to it. No rapport gets created, and consequently, no ground is gained for either side. And the same applies to those who are observing the conversation. My mother passed away in 2016 of recurring breast cancer that had metastasized in her bones. I held very conservative views, as did she in my early 20s. She maintained those all the way up until to, till her death, while I moved on and into more libertarian views. We would frequently talk about these differences very regularly, either on the phone or when I went to visit. Out of those exchanges, I developed what I like to call the mother test. Even though mother held firm to her conservative views, I relished the moments when she would say something like, well, okay, that's a fair point. I mean, it didn't change her views necessarily, but it was a signal that she heard what I was trying to communicate. Now think of the many exchanges you've seen with Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter or whatever lives, or any disagreement for that matter. And then how many do you recall where one or both participants were really hearing the other's perspective? Recall this statement from the social intelligence book that I quoted earlier. As two people attend to what the other says and does, they generate a sense of mutual interest, a joint focus that amounts to perceptual glue. Correcting someone who you believe is wrong, that's using the wrong word, all or black or blue, to describe whose lives matter is not generating a sense of mutual interest. It does not leave that person feeling that they've been experienced. And that is the problem with this dispute between Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. And it's equally shared by all parties. The same challenge also exists in other commentary, such as telling somebody that they're speaking from white privilege, or somebody saying, you know what, they should have just followed orders. It speaks at someone instead of engaging with them. So what's the solution? 
Well, that's where our hostage negotiator comes into play. Chris Voss was a former FBI hostage negotiator, and he wrote this book called Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It. He has a chapter titled Be a Mirror, where he offers negotiating tips that I think fit very well with our everyday conversations. And if you're a bit skeptical learning lessons from a hostage negotiator just to engage on the internet with maybe friends or family or even a rando, consider this first excerpt from Voss's book. Quote, Negotiation serves two distinct vital functions, information gathering and behavior influencing, and includes almost any interaction where each party wants something from the other side. Negotiating, as you'll learn, it here is nothing more than communicating with results. Observing a myriad of conversations, last year's outbreaks of violence across the United States, and then the storming of the Capitol earlier this year, I'd say we could use some different results. Let's walk through Voss's six key lessons from the Be a Mirror chapter and see how we might get those different results. If we chose a single word to represent each of those, we might come up with something like this. Prepare, open, discover, others, slow, and smile. Let's start with the first one. Prepare. Quote, this is a quote from the book. A good negotiator prepares going in to be ready for possible surprises. When you see a comment on Facebook, Twitter, or anywhere, you should always prepare yourself to be surprised. And you should always expect to be surprised. That doesn't mean that you'll agree. It just means that you anticipate learning something you didn't know about the person or their view. The second one is open, which here's a quote from the book. Don't commit to assumptions. Instead, view them as a hypothesis and use that to ne- that negotiation to test them rigorously. Too often, we assume we know everything we need to know about the person or their position. In fact, there's even a common phrase that you've probably heard and seen many times. It goes like this. This tells me everything I need to know about the person. It's necessary to remain open to realizing that your assumptions may be wrong. We might find that our assumptions were correct or incorrect, and we might find that they were so for reasons we didn't realize. The third, uh, the third word, discover, comes with this quote. Negotiation is not an act of battle. It's a process of discovery. The goal is to uncover as much information as possible. The more information you uncover, the more information that you have to speak to the person. But more importantly, the more they feel they've actually been heard. Remember, in that book, Daniel Goleman's comment in Social Intelligence was about two people attending to what the other says and does. Everyone wants to be heard, and everyone wants to feel their opinion has value. While the process of discovery shouldn't be a a series of 20 questions, it should make the other person feel like they are being experienced, while you, simultaneously, are learning more about who they are and why. Number four, others. Here's his quote. To quiet the voices in your head, make your soul an all-encompassing focus, the other person and what they have to say. Ever seen that saying that says, I have ADD, I'm not listening, I'm waiting for my turn to speak. Well, unfortunately, Too many of us hear something we don't like and immediately start thinking about our response. American novelist Truman Capote 
liked to claim that he had over 90% memory recall of conversations. It's arguable whether or not his memory recall was actually that high, but he was known to be really, really fascinated by those he engaged with. Even if it wasn't over 90%, it likely was higher than most, simply because of his focus on those he was speaking with and what they had to say. Number five, slow. Here's the quote, slow it down. If we're too much in a hurry, people can feel as if they're not being heard. You risk undermining the rapport and trust you've built, end quote. Have you ever heard the saying, people don't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel? It's true and rushing the conversation leaves others feeling unheard. And when someone doesn't feel heard, it really doesn't matter what great point we feel we've made or we've actually made. I've accepted that rarely will someone's mind be changed in any single conversation. I like to think in terms of preparing for tomorrow's conversation by how I engage today, hence the tagline. If I'm to convince a person of a new idea and it takes multiple conversations to get there, I need to consider that each conversation builds on the last and is equally important. If I rush the first one, the person I'm speaking with may not give me the opportunity to get to the conversation where they are finally convinced. And then finally, the last one, smile. Quote, put a smile on your face. When people are in a positive frame of mind, they think more quickly and are more likely to collaborate and problem solve instead of fight and resist, end quote. Think of those who have influenced you the most. How do you perceive their personalities? I'll bet dollars to low carb donuts that you find them pleasant. There's always exceptions, but more often than not, we aren't drawn to those who are jerks and it may be hard to do so, some ideas are so distasteful we might have serious trouble approaching the people who hold them with even the slightest of pleasantness. But remember, you are engaging in a process of discovery, and you should be looking for the surprises that you are certain to find. And that is how we create the experience of being experienced. We think of each interaction as an opportunity to build rapport. We then use these hostage negotiation tactics to build that rapport and influence people over time. We prepare ourselves to be surprised, remain open to what we think we know, we treat the engagement as a process of discovery, we remember to focus on others, slow down our desire to get to the end, and we remember to smile, to keep ourselves in a positive frame of mind. The next time someone asserts something that you vehemently oppose, recall these lessons. Change your approach from telling to learning. It doesn't mean that you won't make any assertions because it's not a game of 20 questions. The goal is to just ensure that the other person feels experienced. And it isn't about just about being nice. In fact, I'd say it isn't about being nice at all. It's about being productive. Or as Voss said, as I stated earlier, communication with results. I hope you found this episode's topic insightful. For now, it is time for a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Welcome back to the bill review. The goal of Bill Reviews is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Now, since I'm not a lawyer, this isn't, illegal, this isn't legal interpretation, and I may be wrong. Bills range from page or two up to thousands of pages long, and since they can be rather dry, this segment is short and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in only a few minutes. Continuing with the theme of Black History Month, I'm going to focus on bills that are related to, you guessed it, the black community. In the last episode, 
I reviewed President Biden's Executive Order 13995, titled Ensuring an Equitable Pandemic Response and Recover. In this episode, I'll review a second executive order, number 13985, titled Advancing Racial Equity and Support for Underserved Communities Through the Federal Government. Oh, that's a mouthful. When evaluating any bill, executive order, or mandate from a government official, it's always best to identify exactly what its purpose is, the action to be taken, and the measure of success. And sometimes, the title itself will tell you quite a bit, though not always. For instance, in this executive order, we see that it ends with the words, through the federal government. Immediately, I get the impression that whatever this executive order is supposed to do will be limited to the federal government. Moving on, under Section 1, titled Policy, we find its purpose. Quote, It is therefore the policy of my administration that the federal government should pursue a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all, including people of color and others who have been historically underserved, marginalized, and adversely affected by persistent poverty and inequality. End quote. It's always good to be on the same page before disagreeing or even agreeing with any assertion. The executive order defines equity in section 2, stating this, quote, The term equity means the consistent and systematic fair, just, and impartial treatment of all individuals. End quote. It then goes on to clarify the following, quote, including individuals who belong to underserved communities that have been such denied uh, treatment such as Black, Latino, and Indigenous and Native American persons, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders, and other persons of color, members of religious minorities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ plus persons, persons with disabilities, persons who live in rural areas, and persons otherwise adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality. End quote. Liberty Wife will tell you that I have a penchant for being a stickler with words, sometimes annoyingly so. Of the included individuals in Section 2, it specifies a list of communities that, quote, have been denied such treatment, end quote. Now remember, this executive order's title explicitly states through the federal government. And in the purpose, President Biden states that the policy of his administration is that the federal government should pursue. That's a direct quote. My first question is, are these communities still being denied? If the answer is no, then we must ask why the executive order is even necessary. However, Let's assume that by the very fact that Biden had to write this executive order, it means the answer is yes. Then we ask, well, why? And who is to blame? It might be popular to blame President Trump, but that doesn't really make sense because, as we'll see, this executive order does not specify any areas where equity lacks. Aside from the things that President Trump said, much of what he did wasn't new to the office of the president. And his political career was only four years long. Which leads to another question. What about prior administrations? Well, after all, the new, vice, the new President Biden was once Vice President Biden in the previous administration. And the reason I ask this is that I want to understand the purpose and necessity of this order, which requires knowing what existed before. And since many people in office switch positions and serve long political careers, it's good to know if proposed legislation, executive orders, and other government decrees are just paying lip service or they will really improve the lives of ordinary citizens. To start, I'm already unclear about the issue identified in the purpose statement of this executive order. It doesn't specify who or what may be the cause or how long it's been a problem. But let's leave that aside for a moment and ask a different question. What action does it take? Well, under Section 4, Identifying Methods to Assess Equity, it says this, quote, 
the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, shall, in partnership with the heads of agencies, study methods for assessing whether agency policies and actions create or exacerbate barriers to full and equal participation by all eligible individuals, end quote. And then, goes on to say this, quote, as part of this study, the director of OMB shall consider whether to recommend that agencies employ pilot programs to test model assessment tools and assist agencies in doing so, end quote. This executive order also gives some timelines. Within six months of its date, the director of the OMB is supposed to give a report to the president of best practices found and then recommend approaches to expanding them to the rest of the federal government. And each agency head, well, they have 200 days to review and provide a report of their agency's practices to, quote, assess whether underserved communities and their members face systematic barriers in accessing benefits and opportunities, end quote. In the last episode, I pointed out that executive orders also pro, uh, pro, that that executive order also proposed a study to see if issues existed, and like that executive order, this one appears to assert a problem exists in the purpose, but then require a study to see if and where. A simple reading suggests that this executive order, like the one in the last episode, is merely a fact-finding mission. President Joe Biden has held several positions since his political career began in 1973. He served as a U.S. Senator, Vice President, and been on multiple Senate committees over his 47 years. This leads me to my real question. How is it in 47 years of political office, in positions with ample view of the federal government's policies and actions, How is it that this executive order has to create groups to study and determine if systemic barriers exist for members of various underserved communities? You know, I've spent much less time in various businesses, and yet I was able to more specifically identify areas where improvement was necessary. And often I had ideas how to tackle those areas. And I've met plenty of others who were able to do likewise. America. When you start really looking into the work of government officials, I think what you're going to start finding is that more legislation, executive orders, and mandates are really no more than fact-finding missions or some other equal level of fluff. And further, I think you're going to find that they rarely end up benefiting us, everyday people. If we are to support any mandate from government, it should only be that which has a very clear purpose, sound and supporting action, and measurable goals that we can use to judge the merits of it later. This executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities does not accomplish any of those. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head on over to trovo.live forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode of Just Me airs Monday night at 10 p.m. Or you can catch me and Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion-style episode of the same topic. And while you're there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, Your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time, and I'm out.